actually using new equipment, so the audio hopefully will be better for mm -hmm. everyone. So um, last week we were finishing introducing everyone. Um, I think you guys also have a few questions in terms of the groups that we'll address uh, after the, the readings. And before we, we begin discussing the four readings for this week, I want to introduce Anna Guillory. Anna, are you there? I think she got online. Anna? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hola, Anna. Hola, Anna. Hi. Hi. It's good to see you. You too. Thanks for doing this, guys. It's been, it's been a, a little hard for me during this time, but I know everyone's had their own kind of struggle. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll try and make it really quick because I know we have to go through um, readings. Mm -hmm. But let me pull up something really quick. I had, had it kind of typed out earlier. So I was, so I'm from Dallas, Texas. I think there was one more person from Dallas too. Um, and I <laughs> am a, also a high school art teacher um, mm -hmm. and artist and um, I primarily work in painting or illustration, but I've recently thought about possibilities of more multidisciplinary work. Um, some things that I'm interested in are, um, well, at the, a residency that I attended with Architopia, it was just this past summer in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I had gone to the residency with, the intentions with were, dealing with this relationship between Texas and Mexico. That was kind of one of my primary reasons of, of going to Mexico, um, but realizing that I was actually asking a much bigger question than just the questions being asked between these two countries, uh, between the state and country and this border. And I tend to gravitate toward elements, and I know this is a problematic term, but... Um, oh my God. Come here, buddy. Uh, natural elements, so elements in nature, um, elements that are, hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I live in a really crowded apartment complex. Um, and elements of nature so things that are seemingly everywhere but not everywhere um nature isn't accessible to everybody um but when i was in Ar archetopia i was doing some shadow tracing so i would make these compositions or paintings and i actually started cutting them out and layering them as sewn pieces um dealing with shadows and then when I started thinking about that more, I, the word ephemeral came to mind. Um, and these elements of life and things that we encounter that are ephemeral. Um, and so I think, I think what I'm really interested in um, is moments of relation. Like what are things that we all observe or experience um, or seemingly walk through that we we're either an observer or we we go through them ourselves um and so to not not negate, not negate the idea that there will always be a level that we don't have to relate to someone on um but i guess what i'm asking is through the metaphor of the shadow is like what ways are we finding solidarity through what things and like through what observances of things um and so that's really where I'm at. And I don't know what that looks like as far as painting or mm -hmm. um, we talked about installation when I was mm -hmm. at the residency. Mm -hmm. um, but right now I'm kind of in an observing stage of now that I've, I feel like I've finally found a term that might evolve, but ephemeral feels really um, grounding, like to explore that more about. Also like the ephemeral art movements, like art that, that didn't keep existing like um it was made and then you know it it went away whether it was made with natural materials or not um 
So I think also interested in that too. It's like, what mm -hmm. does that look like? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, it relates to, to one of the readings. Um, Techniques of the Observer talks a little bit about that, how um, this idea about place is invented, how uh, then it becomes, you know, why photography becomes so relevant to art um, in mm -hmm. the 19th century, 20th century. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting because just like you were mentioning, nature, because it is an invention, not everyone has access to nature. So how nature was invented is also fascinating and how it was uh, overlapped and, and, or collapsed with specific bodies is also uh, necessary to be understood as we talked about during the, the summer. So uh, interestingly enough, as, as you're explaining, uh, the word or the concept of um, ephemeral is, is not necessarily grounding because it's actually, again, thinking about place but it's actually correcting and thinking about the idea of time and space as we encounter. Mm -hmm. So yes, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. So um, I think we also had to introduce, I'm not sure if they're here, uh, Georgia Matthews. Georgia. Because we know it's very late for you. <laughs> yeah. Georgia, are you there? I think you're online. You just have to turn on your microphone. Microphone. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, Georgia. How are you? Hi, Georgia. Hi. How are you? Very good. Very good. It's good to hear you. <laughs> yes, it's good to see you and hear you both. Great. How are you? Good? Yes. Well, thank you. Well, it's uh, 2 13 a.m. <laughs> Uh, Saturday morning, so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we understand why you're not turning on the camera. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just really bad with technology. Hold on. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> it's just <a> year. <laughs> so uh, please tell us um, where are you located, uh, the year of your residency, uh, a little bit more about your practice and a project that you are currently working on. Please. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm currently in Adelaide. I come from Adelaide, South Australia. Um, I was at Arcotopia last year um, in I'm thinking of October, August, September, October. Um, and I was working on a body of work to um, represent and to uh, show at the Adelaide Fringe Festival this year, early this year, 2020. So um, that that happened just before um, coronavirus got to um, Adelaide. Um, so I was quite lucky to be able to exhibit that body of work and get my sort of my things out there. But um, yeah, I um, am a photographer. That's my practice. And I um, was working on uh, capturing nightmares and dreams, the subconscious experience um, uh, during my time at Arcotopia and um, being able to help people tell their narratives through photography and through, through um, documenting um, stories through their interpretation of their dreams and their nightmares. Um, so I'm, I'm developing more of that type of work through um, using the same type of camera, uh, using this very similar methods as well uh, through um, like Holger, so analog photography and being able to use uh, double exposure as a way to inform, inform the viewer about um, two different messages that might interlace and become one message. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, struggling financially to be able to produce more work um however yeah just trying to come up with more concepts around that and and around those um yeah that that method there so yeah thank you georgia yes sure. actually it's your work evolved interesting mm -hmm. in a very interesting direction because this idea of documenting that that is actually a question that you've been addressing you you tackle it when you started thinking about different stories how because stories can't be really documented, they're just a narrative. Mm. So this idea of how you overlap these narratives, it's fascinating because it also challenges the idea of how photography can actually document something when in fact it's just another 
perspective, another image that is created. So yeah, sure. um, we've seen some of your work and it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, wonderful. So if you guys have a chance, Thank she you. Georgia has actually posted uh, several of her, her work in um, Instagram and some images of her exhibition. So if you have a chance, uh, if you can tell us your Instagram again, just for, for everyone. Yeah, sure. It's just uh, GM underscore photography. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank yep. you. <laughs> yes, wonderful. I can send that through. <laughs> yes, thank you, Georgia. So uh, it's exciting to have sure. you all back. And uh, let's begin with the readings. In, in, in this uh, session, we chose four different readings that talk about the history of art, uh, the construction of place or the invention of place, uh, the idea of property in one of them. We're going to start with that. Uh, and also uh, how meaning takes place and then also how we observe. So uh, let's begin for everyone uh, with coloniality, comma, modernity slash rationality. And we're going to change it to coloniality. It's going to become an equation, coloniality plus modernity equals rationality. So let's begin by trying to define what is coloniality. What do you guys come up with and, and think about coloniality? Yes, Rusty. So I, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna like just read from my notes a little bit and I just uh, quoted uh, Anibal Quijano um, that is, yep. uh, the coloniality is a cultural complex known as European modernity, rationality, the intersubjective universe produced by the entire Euro-centered capitalist colonial power was elaborated and formalized by the Europeans um, and established the world as an exclusively European product and as a universal paradigm of knowledge and of the relation between humanity and the rest of the world. So it's, it's a pretty neat trick. In a, I mean, to, to, to say um, it, it really was a way of like seducing, uh, well, she talks about the seduction of um, my mysticism is, is really what you want and, and the parceling out of uh, forms of knowledge that other people didn't have. Um, it's, but it, it, it's a way of saying, it's a way of consolidating power, really. Is, is, is kind of how I see it, is, is, is ways of saying this is the right way and getting everyone to buy into it, um, which again is a neat trick because it's it's not, you know, it's, this, there's not only one way of knowing things. Right, 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 <laughs> absolutely, yes. And I see several problems with the term in, in terms of how it is uh, actually defined. So for instance, European is highly unstable. So, one of the things that we're going to start seeing is that modernity is imagined as linked to Europe. And Europe is a geographical region, but not everyone who lives in Europe necessarily agreed, thinks. Uh, so it is how Western is invented as a term that creates the origin of history, invents the idea of progress, but it's actually everything horrific that has happened to everyone. And this is a definition that um, Kirsten Buick uh, gave us. This idea of Western needs to be destroyed because the center doesn't really exist. So even when we use uh, Europe in this context, it's referring to that same idea. Europe is a vast region with many complexities that not necessarily would define uh, one specific way of organizing power. Uh, it imagines it can, but it, it can't actually. So in, in, two, in one or two sentences, or in just a few words, what would, modern, uh, what would coloniality be? Yes, Jesse. Um, from what I understand coloniality to be is um, the, what is left behind after colonizers are, are out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's how colonialism, colonialism is still enacted by the colonized people and how we continue to to push that. Right, right. It is it is actually uh, trying to figure out the relationship between the process of colonization because the reality is that 
in many places, it didn't happen as it happened in, for instance, the United States or for instance, in uh, India or for, you know, regions where colonization happened actively as a part of the empire. In, in Mexico, it's part of it, but, but also in a very complex way, uh, decided not to be part of it, which creates, uh, you know, even more problems in many ways. So it is imagining as, it is trying to understand what is the difference between uh, colonization and coloniality. And, and Jesse is actually pointing at that. It's when we keep doing the work of the empire and there's actually no colonizers needed. So coloniality is how we continue to do the work for the empire. Whether we agree or not, we continue to do it. And, and it's not only the idea of race, it's actually also the idea of class. And, and, and the, the scholar, Aníbal Quijano, doesn't really talk about gender, but I would include also gender because he begins to sketch how ideology has been put in place, how ideology organizes place and creates one single narrative that we know as history. Hmm? So now let's try, do you, have, do you guys have any questions? Yes, Denise. Okay, uh, I think that we should look at the term as a uh, positive now, because the colonization is in the past, the history, and we're left with this. And I see it as a synthesis of uh, cultures and what we can do with it and what we can learn from it. And, and in particular, I, I guess I have in mind the, the natural dye workshop um, mm -hmm. from Peru mm -hmm. that, you know, really what was um, an understanding of another time period, another culture, another way of doing things and how you can bring that into um, today. So I want to see colonization or coloniality mm -hmm. as a synthesis of cultures. Um, I'm not saying, you know, that we disregard the hate uh, or the pot negative things of the past, but, right. but I want right. to make it positive. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we have to remember is that modernity that emerged in the 16th century actually kidnapped the meaning of words. So even if we try to change the meaning of words, we can't. However, I agree in the sense of what you're referring to is uh, what we call epistemology. Because yes, what happened in the process of colonization, it's also other uh, forms of resistance, other forms of knowledge were produced, other possibilities, even for us to exist. Because when we look at history and when we look at everyone who's in, in this virtual room, most of us, if not everyone, has been imagined as exterminated, let alone have a voice in the arts. So well, when we think about coloniality is the legacy of colonization, it can be positive, yet we're going to work with the positive possibilities of, of the process. Uh, because yes, it, this, this, uh, addressing this concept is not to dwell and, and to have a chip on our shoulder and say, well, we can just you know, uh, get over it. It's, it's actually a process in which we continue to exterminate. And we're going to link this reading eventually with empty the museum and, and why coloniality is a process of devastation that it, it expands into every direction so more uh it is actually the response to coloniality what you're talking about that we will use how do we find the positive outcome of the encounter not necessarily the encounter in the way it was framed when america as, as a place was invented but it's actually how when we meet each other and we uh, create sparks and friction, there's knowledge that can change that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Denise. So let's, uh, do you guys have any questions about coloniality so far? Me, it's not a question. It's more something that for me was interesting about this reading was about the, they mentioned the, Cultural and culinary difference was in different times and different cases, and that mm -hmm. caused violence 
and the violence caused at the same time genocides. Mm -hmm. So, and either they mentioned about the new correct order. Yes. That with the new, and how the island, how this new order is a new power uh, beside the color skin, the cap capital system. And for me, it was really, really interesting this because, as you know, I have been here for a while and color skin doesn't matter. People doesn't, doesn't care about the color skin. But I noticed that even class here in Urubamba don't exist. People act in the same way. So for me, it was really, really interesting how the how to be this class system in different ways when at the end doesn't matter for so many people. I don't know if I understand me. Yes. Yes, I think the 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 key point that you're mentioning is that really ideology doesn't exist mm -hmm. as something biological or physical and it varies depending on the place depending on the encounter depending on so many things class um, in latin america is the the most important signifier we might not be able to read it sometimes because it's hard to relate to it but race and class operate together so the color of the skin is only a small signifier in Latin America. It doesn't mean that it, it, people are not capable of being racist. It doesn't mean that uh, racism doesn't exist. But what is worse is, is classism, cla this idea of, of being able to discriminate through, through class. And one of the things that the scholar is actually uh, unpacking is how from the process of colonization and and the expansion of empire as, as an abstract idea, as a, as a new uh, system that organizes everything, these ideologies emerge and created distortions. And we're going to keep thinking about this because when we encounter the empire, empire, more than the empire, empire is highly invested in minimizing friction and the way, and friction is good, it's actually how we are changed whether we want it or not. And empire is highly invested in minimizing this friction. That's how race, class, gender, age, any form of uh, dominant differences that are invented were actually rooted in, in modernity and colonization and now are repacked and put into coloniality. Thank you, Sayani, for, for the question. We're gonna move to modernity so that we can understand the problem of uh, coloniality plus modernity equals rationality. Who could define, uh, who wants to, to tackle the term modernity? What would modernity be? What would be the meaning? How could we describe it? This may yes. be incomplete. <laughs> okay. Yes, Taylor and then Casey. Yes, go, go ahead, okay, Taylor. Sorry about that. I was That's like, okay. um, yeah. This is probably incomplete, but um, the, I think one of the main factors of modernity is this um, this idea of progress, which is invented. You know, like how do you define progress, or um, what is progress? You know, these kinds of things. So maybe Casey can fill in the rest. But I think progress—that um, mm -hmm. idea of it—is really important here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Taylor. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, for sure. Um, two notes that I had written down from a previous meeting with you guys was like modernity is a narrative about time mm -hmm. um, and it involves profit. So the mm -hmm. progress I think that Taylor was talking about relates to the time part and mm -hmm. it's kind of like forgetting the past for profit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, those are the two kind of bullet points that I, that I made. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's forgetting about the past, looking only into the future, a future that doesn't really exist mm -hmm. and only for profit. And, and this is when we are seeing the change in the system. This is why we are, because it was not working, we're being forced to be back at, in our homes and it has to be reorganized. How empire is going to strike back? That's the biggest question <laughs> that we have to address eventually. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. So then what would it mean when we say 
coloniality plus modernity equals rationality. If I ask you guys, you have to be rational. What am I implying there? Hi. Yes. Sí. Hola, Mariana. Sí, Mariana. Hola. ¿cómo Hola. Están? Muy bien. Uh, I think that uh, the point of that is the fact that it is referring to what is like the Cartesian system of no making knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that refers to like using a specific system of creating knowledge to dismiss everything else. Mm -hmm. And rationality refer I, I believe that it refers to that, but uh, that system is imposed in the case of Latin America, it is imposed, it exterminates all other types of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that we have this system and this method to create knowledge. Mm -hmm. So rationality refers to that. So you have to follow the specific steps mm -hmm. of to produce knowledge, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Absolutely. This is this is the way we have to be, we are forced to be. So with this in mind, how could we explain rationality? What is rationality? Yes, Rusty. I mean, given how we've defined coloniality and modernity, it's, I mean, it seems to me that it's an erasure of the self as a as a generator of knowledge or meaning, it's 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 only accepting received forms, um, and process and processing it like a machine almost. Right, right. And and we're gonna make here the distinctions between the self and the I. The self we're going to use as a term that describes the process of encounter that we will eventually will think about, and the I is the invention that the Cartesian ideal. Uh, produced that Mariana talked about. So with the Cartesian ideal, I think, therefore I am, and the idea of rationality, who, how could we define rationality? What is rationality? It's like conforming to somebody else's beliefs because they're imposed on you. Yes. And to someone else's actions. And so your, your actions are, are are believed to be um, the reason why you act because it's somebody else. So it's kind of yes. like a, what society thinks you should do. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Daniela, because it is a form of moral judgment. Yeah. That's it. It's not science. It's not real. It's an invention and forms of moral judgment that we'll see through history. Because, for instance, we all see beauty and we all define it very differently. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But beauty as a form of moral judgment was used to exterminate people. Because you're ugly, you're stupid, because you're stupid, you deserve to die. Just to simplify something mm -hmm. much more complex. But then beauty will become eventually, will, will progress using the context that Taylor provided, this idea of, of the history of progress become aesthetic and then and that's in aesthetics in the um, 18 19th century and then in the 20th century becomes irony irony can also is also a form of moral judgment and irony is very relevant to contemporary art it's not that we don't understand what we see in the museum it's because we're stupid and we don't get the joke you know just to simplify forms in which things are being reorganized in, in through institutions. So the yes, so the equation is coloniality, how we continue to do the work for the empire. And we have to keep in mind that even if we ally with the empire, we're still going to be exterminated. This is a problem. So how we continue to do the work for the empire, even without our consent, then uh, forgetting about the past, looking into the future only, and with the condition of being for profit equals being rational. The only way in which you can be human and human is also an invention. Mm -hmm.
It doesn't mean that our experience is not real. It doesn't mean that we don't think. It doesn't mean, but we think and feel much more than we can actually explain. It's not that the card can actually explain what we, what is our experience. Now, the key point of this reading is that it invents property and property is highly relevant to understand place. So who could explain property? What do you guys remember from, from the reading? Coloniality, modernity, rationality. How is Aníbal Quijano defining property? And I only see a few of you on, on the screen. So if you want to participate, just turn on your microphone and we'll organize them as, as we go. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I've asked this question several times before. Yes, Jesse, go ahead. Um, well, what I understand by property and also from what I remember from previous conversations with you both um, is property is, is, is essentially um, emotionally connecting with an object. So it, it ties into like sentimentality mm -hmm. and, um, and stating that you have something that somebody else doesn't have. So, so for like property to exist, there has to be the presence of a person who doesn't have the thing that you have. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, it is a relationship mm -hmm. precisely, absolutely. So it is a mental connection with an object. Let's say this is my marker and it's also the physical possession of the object. These are two conditions that we know, but there's two more conditions that Jesse just mentioned. There has to be a second or a third person. I usually put it together into a third person because it could be the city, it could be the state, it could be the country, it could be everyone, or it could be just one single person. And also there's an intention in relation to that person. This is how place was invented through modernity in the 16th century. Prior to that, the notion of property did not exist in that violent way. Doesn't mean it didn't exist it, because remember, modernity kidnapped the meaning of words. And uh, there's now a few, or maybe many ideas about uh, property that is community-based, ways of sharing things and re you know sharing resources in different possible ways. You know, this crisis makes evident that the way property has been handled is is through modernity and is for extermination. So we have to rethink how we relate to each other. How I, I relate this, this um, reading to our practice has to do with the idea of audience because uh, Aníbal Quijano also explains that knowledge since the 16th century has been uh, treated as property in, in the same way as property, except we don't require the physical possession for knowledge. So knowledge would be the this feeling that you are connected to the idea, that you possess the idea, you don't require to possess it, but it also requires a third person and an intention. So even when we read Aníbal Quijano's essay, his intention might be, it's not for us to get smarter, it's for him, he, probably he wanted to convince us of his ideas because of the way he writes, but also it's showing that he has more authority than we do. That's the function of knowledge. It's not really to make us smart. It's, it's made in specific ways and it's always organized through power. Now, remember the art belongs to the realm of knowledge. Therefore, there's always a third implicated. That's our audience. And there's always two questions about it. The reality of who sees our work, which is beyond our control. We can't control where our work goes, but it also shows a trail of power how we have a complicated relationship with power and how power determines what we do. And uh, the second question would be, who ideally is, could be our audience? Who ideally we wanna make the work for? And I usually suggest to think about one person with a face, with a body, with, with feelings, with a relationship that you have with that person. Not necessarily that you have to dedicate it publicly, but bringing back the reality of an audience as a as a someone that we have had an encounter with changes the relationship we have with modernity and also with art history. Can I raise a question? 
Yes, absolutely, Mark. Good Mark. Uh, yes. Hola, Mark. Uh, hi. Um, to, in my mind, modernity is wrapped up very much with uh, individuals taking on the power that we used to ascribe to the emperor. That is to say, I am now the emperor. Uh, that I, that I, 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 I want to have power the way the emperor used to have power for the whole system, right? So, so in that kind of context, um, for me to imagine the person for whom I might make my art mm -hmm. can easily become an extension of my grasp for power. That is to say, I could make art mm -hmm. primarily to, to enlarge my sphere of influence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the extent to which my ego, blah, blah, blah. You got the whole idea. Okay. Yes, yes. So, so I wonder whether it might be useful, at least for some of us who mm -hmm. do have some sense of power, to think not of individuals, because if I think of an individual, I'm likely to think in my usual pattern, which is, being one up, being being in in control, being in power. Right. right. If I were to think in terms of um, people I don't know, but but want somehow to relate to, and I have no position of authority with them, mm -hmm. then an uh, example being. Um, um, I was driving down a road in Port-au-Prince and it was raining and there was a woman standing by the side of the road waiting for a, um, to be picked up by a car. And, and, um, and I took a picture of her. I have no idea who she is. She's not in any normal sense the person to whom I might be extending my art. Mm -hmm. you know, I make making my art for, but I I began to image her as, in a sense, a person of power, out there. Mm -hmm. she, now I don't know anything about her, and I don't have to be in personal conflict with her. She was, but a person of power out there, mm -hmm. and and I tried to address doing some of my art as if I was addressing her. Mm -hmm. Can you can you okay? All of which is to ask. Can we, in our in our imagining, trying to get outside the ego of art making, can we begin to address a community rather than an individual? Um, it's a perfect question. Thank you, Mark. Because yes and no. the The problem with with community is that it's intertwined with nationalism. And nationalism in the 19th century reorganized everything, uh, meaning through gender. It, it was the, the, the last, the, the most recent, more than last, the most recent way in which everything has been reorganized. Your question is ideal because it's actually pushing in the same direction that we're driving the conversation. Because whether we think about an individual that we know or not, I usually choose someone I know because I know it's always on, in quotation because we never know anyone. We barely can understand ourselves to even think we can understand somebody else. And it's ideal the way you're framing it because then it's also trying to figure out how do you relate to someone beyond any preconceived notion. The problem we encounter there is, for instance, what we used to describe, and, and it refers to one of the readings that talks about categories. Um, and I think it's in the in the first quotes of the shading meaning reading. When we even use a woman, how do we even know what that even means? It's already a way in which ideology is trying to distort time and space. But yes, what you're describing is it's perfect because it is in that moment where we have to decide not to be the I that invents everything and understand how in the encounter, who we encounter is more important than us. Because then it brings back the 
notion of ethics into the work. So we're, we're actually going in that direction, whether we want to uh, think about uh, an individual who we know or someone we don't know, the reality is that communities only exist based in the style that they invent themselves. So we cannot address necessarily any community because we, we might not be part of it or we might not even understand how it operates. But in the process of the encounter, what is relevant is the way you framed it. And that's how we need to think about our work as a question. I understand this woman is an individual of power. How, in what form, shape, I don't know. I, I cannot even relate to it. Yet, I have to acknowledge the power and I have to figure out how to ask the question. If we make a statement, then it's a problem because we don't know anything about the person. Even if we have known that person for 50 years, we don't know anything about that person. That person keeps changing every time we encounter. But what is really important and valid in the work we do is actually to turn it into a question. That's how we should think about our practice as an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Mark. So, mm -hmm. so now let's connect it with Empty the Museum. And this is a reading that is uh, it's uh, Nicolas Mirsov um, essay, um, and it talks about power. It talks about politics. It talks about art, and contextualizes how art cannot be separated from power. Any form of art is political. So, who wants to give us their thoughts? I had some thoughts about it. Um, yes, Sandra, go ahead. Well, museums are sort of institutions of national identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that within postmodernism, we've had some artists who have questioned the authority of museums, like Fred Wilson when he did Mining the Museum, yep. because museums are really weird they have one thing that they present but you know with mining the museum they also found slave shackles they found a whipping post they found um you know an auction block that was used to auction off slaves and they would sort of display these uh, on the in the same place as like a Biedermeier chair or a Chippendale chair or, you know, silver, a silver serving set to kind of show the dichotomy of that. And, you know, all museums tell these tales of national identity. And I'm thinking specifically of the, the Tate Britain because a lot of those paintings, like they present them as images of power, but they're really, you know, kind of, they're they're so awful in another way when you really look at them like i had shown an example of like it it was meant to commemorate these these children of a wealthy family but the the person who had commissioned the painting was a slaver and it was the two children who were giving the pennies to a beggar and it was their way of saying oh you know we need to have slavery in order to um you know our wealth will trickle down so it was like this very old idea of trickle down economics or you know there would also be the less successful children who would be sent off to the colony in india and they would show him and like the the garb you know like wearing it, what you know Indian people would wear like as a way of kind of demonstrating power. Um, so in in some ways, like if we could continue like Fred Wilson's work in some way or be sort of more honest and telling the complete story. Um, but then, you know, of course, then people don't really want to question their national identity. And so that ends up being the biggest problem there. Um, at the end of my notes for this article, I was trying to think of like, is there any successful example of decolonization? And you answered it last week. You're like, no, it, it can't be done. Um, and so those were a, a lot of my thoughts from that one. Um, you know, I think that detournement is something, you know, that, you, you know, my, of course, my favorite form of it is street art. <laughs> you know, people just go out of the museum and they're like, ah, I'm going to take over the street. Um, 
So, uh, but you know, I, I think that they, it's it's nation, it's it's you know, since it's national identity, nations are really unwilling to mm -hmm. examine their own past. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. And for instance, we have in, in Mexico, we have a very romantic idea with public space yeah. because of muralism mm -hmm. and and muralism is, uh, you know, that moment in, in Mexican history invented place through gender and it, it allowed the extermination of many people uh, through poverty, through exclusion, through and, and the question here is, is a larger question as you're asking, is it possible to imagine an institution that doesn't celebrate extermination, the extinction of the environment, the appropriation of labor? And, and I would say no, because even when we think about residencies, we know residencies are rooted in the um, grand tour and the, the process of colonization and tourism. However, one of the things that I've been thinking and rethinking and rethinking is the, re the residency is not place so much so that to me, these, these 10 years are actually celebrated with you guys. Having this residency now as a place that is a non-place in, in many ways, which is also located at, in the homes, which are you know, vicious places invented by the 19th century, yet we're subverting those rules as a public space versus, you know, slash private place as well. It's, 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 it's incredible. So I don't believe in hope in, in, in that form. I believe in action and, and hope can be uh, eventually turned into action, which is what I, I believe in. Uh, and, and to me, this, this is the, the, the example of that. I'm, I'm so excited and proud of the process that has been happening uh, mm -hmm. because you're driving it. You guys are driving this residency. And to know that, for me to understand that residencies are not here in Puebla or in Cusco with Sayani or in Oaxaca with Carla, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible, not, not necessarily that we will be able to erase place because we still need it and we need uh, artists to be here to challenge that notion, but to understand that there is a, a possibility, there is. I don't know in what form because it is what Audrey Lord said, change cannot be predicted. And it's so freaking scary at this point. We all are scared. We don't know where it, this is going yet. We've been complaining about how we want things to change. Well, here we go. It doesn't mean it's going to, you know, the, the empire is not going to strike back, but it is a possibility where things are being reorganized. And if we don't take action, then again, we'll be falling into the same traps and, and premises than before. Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Hmm? I yes. Have a question. Yes. Um, I have a question about action mm -hmm. um, because this feeling of, or this idea of having to always do something also has this idea of like productivity, which is mm -hmm. um, created by capitalism as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Absolutely. Yes, action is not progress. It's not the notion that we have to turn time into money. And I always mention this because this is something we discover very early in, in the history of Arquitopia, that in Mexico, time is not money. I cannot explain what it is. I know it's a relationship. I know it's a relationship that we have with each other, for instance, right now, but it, but action is not progress or productivity. Action is the possibility. And, and this is where it gets very complicated because to me, the only possibility for action is interruption, interrupting history, interrupting place, because otherwise, change is predicted and then it's not real change. So action should be, and in my case, what I, when I think about my practice, when I think about the residents, when I think about the projects that we do, we aim to interrupt. If you think about your residencies, all the conversations were about interrupting you guys all the time. Why did you say this? What does this mean? What is history inventing? So, in, in, and it's not that I have the answers because clearly I don't have them, but it is, the way in which we can allow space to exist again. Remember that I always say that in the encounter is the only space time that has not been colonized yet. 
it's usually colonized then after you know with gender and race and class and age and nationality and we can go on and on and on so it is how space and time we are aware it cannot be distorted and we have to embrace it with the responsibility that it takes to me that's action as a as a point of interruption mm -hmm. uh, 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 there is a museum that I visited recently that challenges a little bit the edges of uh, the museum piece, which the Museum of the Bread and Puppet Theater. Mm -hmm. The Bread and Puppet Theater uh, Museum is in a little tiny village up in northern Vermont. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are the puppets that they have used over the past 50 years in a whole variety of demonstrations and uh, storytellings that have, have addressed power at various times. Right. What was fascinating about the museum is it's totally chaotic. I mean, they just, it's just a jumble of all this stuff, right? But the stuff is a reminder that you can interrupt the universe. I mean, the, the whole purpose of the Bread and Puppet Theater was to interrupt the order of things, just exactly as you've stated. So here's this museum devoted to the objects of interruption. The, you right. know, the, the puppets are right. the objects of interruption. Right. Right. Yes. And, yes. And, so, and so to some extent, we may be your museum of interruptions. That's, that brings hope to me <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> Although I don't believe in hope. But you know, one of the things that I have always thought about is what are we going to do with everything that because the problem with creating a museum is that now things are worth money. Mm -hmm. And that meant that that money was taken by from someone else. You know, the reality that when we decide that I don't know, this marker is art, and then suddenly its value is changed, it, it is in fact connected to the chain of you know the economic the economy and the chains in which labor is going to be castigated by corporations. So whether we buy a Walmart or not, it doesn't really matter. Eventually, as artists, we create objects where labor is being appropriated. So what you just said is, is, is really interesting because I have always thought, what are we going to do when with our Ketopia when we're gone? Maybe we should all burn it because it, we don't want to turn it into a museum. We don't want to celebrate extermination. However, to understand that these encounters could be that possibility, which is not really a museum, but it is the interruption to all this legacy. Yes, I like that. I like that. So, um, yes, so Mirsov talks about how it is impossible to imagine. Uh, we could imagine, but it doesn't necessarily can exist. Uh, but as, as we are seeing, friction and encounter can actually challenge things, can challenge uh, history and place. Mm -hmm. Let's connect it now with shading meaning. What did you guys find in this uh, reading? And I'm just going to pull up the, the essay so that we can also read the, yes, Shading Meaning by Jennifer uh, Devere Brody. And I want to start with this quote that actually Daniel posted on in the classroom. Categorizing is not the sin. The problem is a lack of desire to examine the categorizations that are made. The problem is the failure to assume responsibility for examining how or where we set our boundaries. And this is from Patricia Williams. Hi again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mariana. So, um, in general, I will just throw in, like for general ideas. I do believe that this reading is like the best way to kind of synthesize what you have been saying about like erasing something. What I like about this reading, or what it makes me understand, is that when you're uh, like by shading the meaning of something, you are like stealing uh, someone else's idea, you are stealing someone else's something just to like put your meaning in it. Uh, for example, when you talked about beauty, the idea that you have about beauty and the idea that I have about beauty cannot be the same, 
but it is different when you use power to overlap either one of those. So this this reading, I think, is like it tries to explain how, like in art, this. Uh, concepts that we have created or how concepts have worked for the empire in terms of like putting people or putting ideas or putting things into some meaning like trying to give meaning to something it's a tool to giving power to something it's like identity or nation it's like yes. you relate to that concept immediately yes because it gives you power over someone or over something Yes, yes, it, it's precisely um, how you're explaining it. I'm, I'm going to contextualize the term throw shade because it's key to understand how uh, shading meaning is relevant. Uh, throw shade, it, it, it comes, you know, I'm going to read the, the, this um, sentence from the essay. Uh, this essay translates a black vernacular understanding of reading in which to read is to critique or to throw shade, meaning understanding that meaning is not real, is an invention. It's something that is created through power. However, reading, and this goes back to our practice, process more than the actual image is what matters. Because this is when, and, and I also uploaded the introduction to this book, uh, Performing the Body, Performing the Text, to keep in mind that reading is a process and we engage through power, of course, with anything. But meaning doesn't really exist. Meaning takes place. And because it takes place, it's related to history. So throwing shade is the possibility of contesting meaning to understand that it's a process of reading more than meaning in itself. So to, to simplify this, meaning cannot reside in objects. Objects do not have meaning. Actually, objects do not exist. They are bodies, and as we encounter them, we perform meaning together. Mm -hmm. So it is a possibility to free our practice to understand that whether, you know, anything that we choose is going to be problematic. So we need to think about the process, not the outcome. That is key. It's not the kind of image we want to produce, it's the kind of process we want to perform. And this has to be related to the viewer. That same process needs to be performed by the viewer in relation to our work. That's how I think the encounter can be extended to the process of reading. Who else wants to add any comments or questions? I just wanted to add that what I got from the reading was that basically you can't have um, one without the other. So in the reading, she was talking about how um, whiteness was defined by blackness. So like the idea that um, these minstrel shows were putting on a character of, of blackness, but they they also like the way I looked at it is like, and I read more about other things uh, on these menstrual um, shows because it was um, very interesting to read what um, this guy said. And said he said that he couldn't define himself because back at that time there was a lot of people saying, okay, well I'm a black African person. I'm gonna. But he, he said I couldn't identify myself as coming from Africa because. I was never there. And so if I went to Africa and I tried to compare myself to these other Africans, I would find that there are white Africans that would break my ideal or of, of, of the blackness. And so he said, so I had to compare myself with what I knew that was around me, whiteness. And so this is the, this idea that he, he um, needed the other to be able to define who he was. Yes, well, actually, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Daniela, because what we see is that in most ideological inventions, there's always two oppositional inventions, right. men, women, when in fact, we're actually in the spectrum in between those two inventions because they don't exist. 
When we think about, right. So for instance, black and white is the same thing. When we think about Mexico is the invention of Indian, native, indigenous. And, and an interesting fact is that indigenous doesn't exist. There's no translation of the word indigenous in the 68 native languages that currently exist in Mexico. So it only disclosed how even indigenous is an invention from the perspective of empire. So in Mexico, for instance, is the invention of our national identity through European, whatever even that means, or Spanish. Today, Spain doesn't even see itself as one. So imagine if we could create any stable identity to create another uh, tension between indigenous, which, as I mentioned, at least there are 68 different languages. You know, from there, there are many other cultural groups that um, are organized in different ways. So even the idea of indigenous is highly unstable, unstable. It's it's an invention. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesse. Oh. oh, Jesse oh, and then, oh. Jesse, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Rusty, mm -hmm. go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was just very, I don't have the exact quote, but I have my notes. Um, I was very interested in, um, she said something about, uh, I mean, she spoke a lot about purity and about how purity was as this thing that we must all um, want. I mean, it's it's the highest form of being or whatever, um, but that the, de the purity can only be defined by negation. So you can't define purity as anything other than what it doesn't have, mm -hmm. um, which I find is is true it is true in the definitions of a lot of of blackness of whiteness of um like so many of these invented things um can only really be defined by by what they aren't instead of mm -hmm. what they are mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely yes we will tie this to the concept of the authentic mm -hmm. uh go ahead rusty okay i was uh i was struck by how um in the in the article she says minstrelry and abolitionists had the same discourse articulating the buried whiteness of the enslaved black and then that that kind of uh it kind of opened my eyes that like you would not put those two things morally in the same space right in if you were thinking about it before this article right um, and and yet they really were doing the same work it, which is is yeah it's uh it's surprise yeah it was surprising that's all right right and this is this refers also to the term minorities which is actually minoritized because it's actually a process that continuously happen minority is not the percentage of population in relation to the majority it's actually the invention of a minor and a, a, a minor in the legal sense is someone who's not capable capable of anything. This is how minorities were invented. Women, historically, have been a minority because they were minors in the perspective of the state and the law. They couldn't vote. They couldn't hold property unless specific conditions were met. You know, this, this process of minoritization has to do with this, this history and this invention, yes. And, and we're going to tie also this to the idea of the authentic and how when we meet in time and space, usually one of us is regarded as the authentic or the inauthentic because it's either one or the other. And I'm sure we can all relate to these instances in which we are forced to play roles that we're not necessarily agreeing with. And when we actually figure it out, uh, sometimes it's too late to respond. You know, it is this situation in which we are either the woman, the immigrant, the a uh, man, the Mexican, you know, in all these instances in which we are. And there's a wonderful book uh, to relate to what Jesse just uh, mentioned. It's uh, the title is Purity and Danger by uh, Mary Douglas. And she actually talks about these inventions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who else wants to Lindsay. comment on this? Yes, hi. Lindsay. Hi. How's everyone doing? Oh, hi. Okay. hi, Lindsay. Um, so something I've been sort of thinking about throughout this whole conversation, really, I think the first time it came to mind was when Denise was speaking earlier, um, just sort of the idea of the mandala and seeing it as this tool, you know, um, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the concept, um, but it's really, you know, almost like I see it as a tool for 
do you see yourself as separate or do you see yourself as one? And it's almost like a way to train your mind, you know, to kind of check in with where you are. How do we view ourselves as separate? Do we view ourselves as the same? Um, so just kind of this idea of unlearning too, you know, and removing those barriers. And when you think of this traditional Buddhist mandala, it almost looks like, I think it's supposed to look like a palace, you know, and it's these walls. And it's this process of erasing those barriers and or not, you can't really erase them, but learning to look past them and, you know, aiming for this oneness. And it's a, it's a practice. It's not an achievement. And I think that relates back to this sort of categorizing and, and assessing the process, not judging yourself, but being open to how you can change. Um, and then I, I really felt like that also applies to the next reading, the observer and, um, seeing yourself as separate, I guess. So. Yes. That's yes. Nice. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, because this relates to to understanding that knowledge is a tool. And what we need to understand is when we choose the specific forms of knowledge, what are we trying to perform? And this also relates to the conversation about uh, cultural appropriation. I don't believe in cultural appropriation because it is uh, it's this invention in which we imagine that we can be politically correct and we can be polite. And, and the reason, for instance, when we see the problem of, of seeing, for instance, a, a headdress of a Native American community from, you know, North America on the runway in a fashion show, it's not that it's offensive. The problem is that it's rooted in the same images that provoke extermination. So it's reenacting processes of extermination for profit, even worse. So... What you bring up, just like uh, in connection with what Denise was thinking about, yes, the, the key is to understand knowledge, knowledge as a tool, as a tool to reorganize or re, re, to correct time and space. And, and I always bring up this example, for instance, the alphabet culturally doesn't belong to us. It was invented in a specific region for a specific purpose, yet we use it to communicate. So the point is how we use this process. Not necessarily that we can reclaim anything, but the process is what matters. If we are only set in images, then we're playing the dangerous game of aesthetics. And, and in that regard also, it's very important to understand that yes, when we meet each other, it's sort of familiar because we know we are connected, but we also need to be aware that we are not the same. We will never be the same. That's the key. The key is not equality. It's actually difference. But it has to be non-dominant differences. It's not race. It's not class. It's not gender. It's not age. It's actually the uniqueness, the uniqueness that we have that makes us different and that makes us never understand each other. That's why we have to try. That's why we have to keep trying to connect because we never understand each other. That's the point. That's what totally. friction can produce. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting too, and I, I didn't mention is, you know, it's used as a tool in meditation, which is really learning about yourself. So it's looking internally to try to understand an external, to try to be a little bit more objective, you know, to try to question yourself mm -hmm. because it's easier to, easier to know yourself you know than it is something on the outside so i think that's interesting right right remember that the idea of public and private is an invention from the 19th century we can't be objective ever mm -hmm. and also we can't learn anything beyond ourselves but it is that awareness that is key it's an awareness that we are alone always, which is very scary, and also that we're dying. And in that loneliness, in that process of being alone, we reach out to one another and we fail because we cannot understand each other. Yet we keep trying because with trying, sparks are produced, friction is produced, and this friction burns. This is what provokes change. Change is not a pleasant. 
but it is necessary. It's a reminder that we will never stay the same because we're all different and we will never be untouched. We're always touched by someone else and we're always going to be changed in that sense. Yes, thank you, Lindsay. Any other thoughts, comments? Yes, Camila. Hello. Hi. Oh, Hello. Oh, uh, Emily first, then Camila. Okay. Yes. Was it Emily or who was it? Oh, Shoko. Shoko. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Shoko, go ahead. Oh, who's talking? Shoko, you... it's, it's your turn. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to to say something about what just uh, Lindsay said. Um, you you talked about um, you know aesthetics and also um, I guess try trying to fix in an image um, an individual experience um, to make it something. Um, I'm sorry, um, I'm not fluent, and it's it's hard because it's such a there's so many nuances in words and, and I can't really, um, uh, how, how can I say it? Um, is it a question about aesthetics? Do you want me to elaborate or, or, or I can translate if you speak French, huh? I can translate if you speak French. Oh, okay. D'accord. Super. Um, oui, ce que je, ce que je veux dire, uh -huh. um, Je, je crois, hein, je crois comprendre de ce qu'il dit, euh, qu'on a tendance à, à sublimer des expériences très personnelles, par exemple, donc elle, elle évoquait le mandala tout à l'heure, euh, comme quelque chose qui, qui devient public, qui devient une sphère commune à une, une communauté ou un ensemble de personnes et que ça devient un langage qui peut tomber dans l'esthétique et qui, du coup, euh, s'éloigne, en fait, de... Euh, qui, qui prend une dimension presque, euh, en ce sens... Euh, euh, Je n'ai pas envie de dire politique, c'est trop fort comme terme, mais... Euh, euh, tu oui. vois, a, a claim in English. Alors là, pour le coup, je ne sais pas le dire en français. Yeah. Mais... Euh, euh, Peut-être c'est mieux si tu dis une chose et après je traduis, parce que si tu me dis beaucoup de choses, c'est beaucoup à registrer pour uh, traduire, tu comprends? Ouais, um, si tu dis I, une I, phrase... I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it in English, <laughs> sorry. Okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, sometimes, like, uh, not sometimes, but I, I guess people need to um, put into form what they experience. Yes, um, absolutely what they experience mm -hmm. uh, and but you know because um, so so then it can become like a, a claim for something mm -hmm. and and be um, a portal to um, to dominate or influence people or yes. spread some belief systems yes um, but before that, it's it's really the primal need to to process something. Uh, you know, it's like it's a, a really organic need to just um, put something out, like a form or uh, a, an image or something visible or touchable. Right, right. To communicate, uh, just to process it, and and that's it. And there's nothing more to it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, because um, you said last time that it could become, you know, a, a tool for domination mm -hmm. uh, or um, a deviant form of. Um, uh, a language that that's that loses his the um the purity of the experience well not the purity but 
Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes, that's the problem with aesthetics that we imagine that it's a term and it's a term that was uh, created through racism. Actually, uh, Immanuel Kant gave more lectures about the superiority of the white race than aesthetics. Yet, uh, philosophy, continental philosophy, invented uh, this term. So yes, uh, so aesthetics in that sense, it, it is it is a term that creates this form of moral judgment. And, the, and this is a perfect example as, as Shoko is, is explaining that um, we cannot control how our intention will be read in, in, the, in terms of art history because intention will not remain in the work. So to think that our work is a statement is the problem that is actually at the core of art history. We need to think about our work as an open-ended question because it is, as Shoko is explaining, it is our need, and I don't necessarily think that it's organic because also biology is an invention, organic is an invention, primal is an invention, uh, deviant is an invention, all these terms, and I'm not saying Shoko doesn't have a point, she has a point. It's precisely the point that she's making mm -hmm. that modernity is taking over with these terms. It is because it's true. As artists, we can only understand ourselves by making. How it's going to be interpreted, who cares? Some of us care, some of us don't, and it doesn't really matter. In the end, nobody's going to ask her opinion because the problem is our work will outlive us. But if we think about the process of performing with the viewer as a process, as an open-ended process, not as a stable meaning, that can allow things to change. And, and again, this is not how we imagine to do the things the right way or the wrong way. It's, it's a process of how we wrestle with our own practice. If, if you guys have questions about aesthetics, I'm also, I can also upload a few readings on Immanuel Kant and the origin of aesthetics so that we can also expand on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Shoko. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now let's connect it with techniques of the observer. What did we find in this reading? And techniques of the observer is by Jonathan Crary. And it's a wonderful book if you're able to get it. I only, um, I uploaded the essay uh, that condensed some of the mm -hmm. questions, but there's, the book was published in 1990. It's, it's very easy to get, so if you guys can get it, it's, it's a really wonderful addition to your uh, library. So who wants to go first? Rusty. Uh, I'll be the canary in the coal mine here. Um, I, I think that this is about in the 19th century how, uh, culture, how science and uh, everything took um, took uh, the, the, gener the generation of knowledge out of the body and said that it's that it's a re again back to received form. It's, it's, it's unchangeable, it's out there, it's part of nature and you are human and you are not part of nature. So it's only observable through science, through photography, through whatever. Um, instead of experiential, um, it were or just or just how you process your experiences. Uh, I, I think that that's kind of what what this is saying is is it is kind of and it's and it's a way of of, of dominating uh, pretty much everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like because then there's a power structure, and whoever's on top is is, is in charge of what knowledge is. Yes, yes, it is the way in which we see today. This is why photography became so popular. This is why other forms of creating images did not become so popular. And it is rooted in the ways in which we see today as an invention. Yes, and it's very much rooted in aesthetics. It's very much rooted in the Cartesian ideal. I think, therefore I am. This also relates to the uh, Nicolas Mirsov's uh, statement of how we can't imagine an institution without these ways of seeing. Yet this, this is also very useful to understand how this way of seeing that we think is, is just the way it is or it's normal or it's 
is what it is, is reality, was invented. Yes. And also there seems to be, this might be slightly tangent to the reading, but um, this beginning of voyeurism, like if we think about with yep. um, the invention of the kinetoscope, which I think we talk about the kaleidoscope in here and some other forms of early mm -hmm. film, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. when film began in that you know pre-1905 era, um, they didn't really know what it was yet, and they weren't starting to inject narrative yet, but they were doing things like early documentaries, like mm -hmm. the Lumiere brothers were going to Egypt and filming mm -hmm. Egypt and going, bringing it back to France and saying, look how amazing all these interesting things are out there in the world, mm -hmm. and start shaping people's ideas of like what you can own almost, mm -hmm. and um, through knowledge, through voyeurism, these kinds of experiences. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Taylor. Yes, because this is how place was invented. This is how tourism functions. This idea that we can travel and not be cold, not be hot, have sunglasses. In the next reading, we're going to actually begin exploring the picturesque as a process of, of this technology that was invented. And, and this also relates to the technology of museums. We're going to begin exploring how the idea of time and space can be distorted and invented as if it, it could actually be uh, distorted when it, it can't to imagine past as a place and that's how museums as uh, sandra was explaining uh, are invented we imagine we control time and we move through space and everything stays still it's also very familiar to many touristic experiences peru for instance mm -hmm. Most of the tourist industry in Peru is invented through this way. This is how knowledge was uh, preserved from the past. No, it's not true. You know, we have these conversations with Maria, our wonderful instructor in, from um, Chinchero, and she teaches weaving and, and natural dyes. And it's a process of expanding the knowledge. She, it was passed on to her, she perfected it. She's passing it to someone else, it's being perfected. We are expanding this to our artists, they are expanding on the knowledge of color. So it never remains the same. It's this idea that things can exist in two times, different times at the same moment, it's impossible. Hmm? Other comments, other questions? I, I was taken in the, in the reading by the whole description of how optics as a mechanical process became identified with um, uh, notions of what perspective was about and, and, um, and how photography, at least at first, looked as if it would be the way of describing things as they really are. Now, all of that objectification gets blown away when photography becomes more and more digitalized and therefore you can manipulate the digits. You can manipulate the, the on and off switches. What I do in my art is mostly working in one color against a background, the, the paper color, whatever that paper color is, and, and usually black on top of that. I'm doing very gross markings on a page, but you can now do the same thing with digital printing because you can manipulate every individual digit, every, every dot, right? Every, every pixel can be manipulated. And as a result, there isn't any more objective reality attached to the photograph. Now, at least in digital photography, the objective reality is no longer there. And it is easier, I th it seems to me, for modern photographic artists to begin to do imaginary uh, challenges to what their eyes see, right? I mean, you can, you can make a photograph of some place that is in fact visually quite different from the way the place is mm -hmm. as experienced, but nonetheless, it will, it will represent what you experience about it. Right. Yes, Mark. That's that's very key because there is actually no objective image ever. 
even photography in that sense. And in the next set of readings, I included a reading on Instagram to understand how it's actually rooted in the picturesque and how even if I take, uh, if I take a photo with my phone without looking, that image is already edited. It's already rooted in the history of photography. There's, there's, a, there's an article, I'll see if I can find it. It's a short article that uh, explains how photography was invented through the uh, skin tone of a specific group so that other groups could not be photographed or were not being, you know, they couldn't be photographed yet it was regarded as a science. So all images are invented. They're never objective. And this is a perfect example that we can use. Uh, thank you, Mark, because it, it is actually understanding how all images are imaginative in many ways, in every single way. So it is about the experience. It's not about the place. We can never photograph a place. Well, place, yes, because place is actually in, rooted in history, but not space. Space cannot be photographed. So it is this possibility of understanding how our experience is actually making us read and it's actually throwing shade a place. It is actually how we can free ourselves to understand that we have no responsibility in portraying an objective reality. First of all, because we can. Second, because our, our responsibility is larger than that. Knowing that our images will be used against us always, then we have to think, how can we uh, present them as a process, as this very non-objective way of looking at things? And, and before I forget, I want to also mention, there's, we recently had a conversation with one of our scholars, uh, Siamak uh, Denzeldeh from uh, Iran, and he's based in Tehran, and he recommended this book, Florence and Baghdad, Renaissance Art and Arab Science. And this is to understand how the one point perspective is not a European, quote unquote, European invention. It is actually a science that could have been wrong, that could have been interpreted, misinterpreted. So it's, it's, uh, you can find it on Amazon. It was published in 2011 and it's by Hans Belting. Uh, yes, somebody else had questions or comments? Me. Um, yes, go ahead. Just a comment. Hi. Uh, the the only thing that I want to say that it's like a compliment, uh, like complimenting Mark's uh, comment is that mm -hmm. also the reading leads you to this idea that the observer is observing only through the eyes. So, like mm -hmm. you as an observer are completely dispossessed of all the things that you have but your eyes, and that also leads you. To another thing which is interpretation of color and how color is or can be used as a tool for uh, controlling or for perception or for like embracing power mm -hmm. yes thank you mariana yes this is this is a very relevant point because whenever we have meetings i i always remind artists that it's not about feeling or thinking and it, it, it relates to seeing as well, we see with all of our senses. This is how we experience things. This idea that we can only, and, and this reading of, uh, that explains the, the technology of the 19th century could be also compared to the one point perspective that emerged in the Renaissance as an invention. It was almost like cinema. It was how images were revolutionized to be able to present reality. And, and remember that images are very seductive. So it's always one perspective in an ocean of perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mariana. Who else? Hi. Mm -hmm. Hola. I, uh, uh, Tonali, yes, go ahead. So, uh, something that I, I, I found very interesting from the reading was how these devices, uh, the provides access to the real and real um, quote and because which is and also related to how the creation of the place of place and how this place is controlled mm -hmm. by others you no know? and in which i was wondering which level uh, the cinema 
is capable of um, represent mm -hmm. out of that space, out of that um, frame. Um, I was wondering how. If, if, it, if it's possible for cinema to, to move beyond place? Yeah. Uh, yes. I Yes, it is. It is possible for all all techniques. It really depends on in our practice. the The problem with cinema is that it's, for instance, in in to give a specific example, when we think about Mexico, Mexico was invented through cinema, and and to connect it also with with uh, the question that Anna was bringing up earlier, uh, the relationship between Texas and Mexico pretty much framed the way in which Mexico was invented as a landscape, as this colorful, uh, and, and not, not only that, it is, it is a product of the Mexican-American War, it is also how Mexico reinvented its national identity to be able to quote-unquote claim and, and from the perspective of power reorganize it, when in fact it became a horrific, terrible tradition that has you know, destroyed so many uh, possibilities of knowledge, people, etc. It, it is uh, when we look at the cinema of the 19th century, of the early 20th century in Mexico, and also as we move to the golden age of cinema in Mexico, it is very much rooted in the idea of landscape and how landscape um, has invented place. Now, yeah. landscape, it is the supreme, one of the most important forms of extermination. It is how it, it, these images were invented so that in the imagination of people, it could morally justify intervention in many other communities. Now, the question that you're asking is precisely about process. How, how do we get to that point? To me, it has to do with understanding space and time. Knowing that space and time are the only two conditions that we can rely on. There's no beyond that. Uh, there's no past, there's no future. There is a, a, a narrative that imposes meaning and meaning takes place in relation to history. So how we can contest that has to do with correcting uh, time and space as opposed to place and history. And any technique can achieve that. And it's actually not, not the job of the technique, it's actually the, the creator, the artist has the responsibility. And, and how we think about time and space as uh, not one single narrative, but actually as an open-ended question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. and, and I'll see if I can find examples on, on, on that because uh, I usually don't give the answer as, as easy as that. Uh, you know, there are some examples in which we can see the work of artists who, who challenge time, you know, who, who correct time and space and bring that challenge back. Uh, and I'll see what I can find for the end of, of the residency for, in terms of cinema. Absolutely. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, I just had a few thoughts I wanted to share. Um, mm -hmm. Someone who's been actually really inspirational in my practice for years and years. Um, his name's Philippe Halsman. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with his work, but he's a photographer. Um, he has a pretty interesting story too. He was actually saved by um, Einstein during World War II when he was being persecuted by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a really interesting person. He was an engineer. And anyway, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure he was the person who invented the camera that you look through the lens, mm -hmm. which I find just really interesting. Like he wanted to convey his own experience with this person. I think that was a sort of acknowledgement that this photograph isn't mm -hmm. a truth. This photograph is my perception. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was a big shift. And I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. it's interesting to look at how the technology unfolded and progressed and mm -hmm. what that, what that um, creates possibilities for. Mm -hmm. um, and on a side note, my my family actually came over from Germany um, in the 1800s and ran a photography shop for about a hundred years. Oh wow! Um, and it wasn't art for them, you know. Right. It was documentation. Mm -hmm. And um, right. just looking at that shift of like this was this this um, sort of trade that they passed down through generations. That was right. how they survived, you know. Right. And, mm -hmm. And then it's being translated into a form of expression. And I just find that interesting. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lindsay. If, if you could actually type uh, the name of, of the artist 
into the the mm -hmm. uh, chat space and and now I will keep uploading the transcripts into the classroom. Mm -hmm. I already uploaded the first session mm -hmm. in video and also I will keep uploading the transcripts as we go. If you guys can think of any other examples of artists, we are happy to look into them and we can think about their work, expand on it, etc. So um, one last question before we move on to, to the next part of, of the meeting. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Yes, can I? Yes, Shoko, if... go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I listened to um, the, the podcast that I think it was fun, um, posted last mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. um, with you, Paco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, you were mentioning uh, how um, Mexico is fixed in the past depending on uh, I, I don't know how you articulated this, mm -hmm. but um, you know, when you were just talking about um, landscape and um, e e exotic, um, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you say exo exotism? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Exo yeah, exotism. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, it was a way for the white to fix. Um, um other areas in th in the past and thus um like dominate and uh like ha c can you can you elaborate on that um, yes absolutely absolutely you're referring to the uh, podcast episode of latinos who lunch and, yeah, and yes 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 absolutely it, well it, it is uh place is invented through power and what you're going to see in the next set of readings is that there's a difference between space and place space is a relationship and, and this is a per perfect example we are all in the same space miles or kilometers away from each other so many countries so many cities so many experiences yet we're in the same space so space is not physical it's a relationship and place is invented and and remember that colonization is never something done to somebody and that's it we always participate and we always negotiate and we always claim specific relationships in that sense so for instance mexico as a place mexico is is as an invented place right it's not necessarily fixed in the past yet the tourism industry including the the board of tourism has continued to reinforce the idea that mexico is fixed in the past as a colorful place because remember color according to um goethe he he claims that color is reserved only for uncivilized people to women and children and indigenous so mexico claimed that tradition and try to reinvent it. Is it possible to reinvent it without violence? No, it's not possible. So it is uh, you never. Said, mm -hmm. uh, you, you said Goethe uh, did what? He, uh, oh, he, he wrote a book on color. He's actually mentioned in the reading, uh, I think it's the Camera Oscura, yes. The Techniques of the Observer and uh le let me and i think taylor tape already the type the 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 name so that you can actually have mm -hmm. a reference because it it is pronounced differently depending on the place um and he's uh he, johan wolfgang von goethe yeah i just missed missed the the, the verb become... oh uh -huh. yes he he wrote a book on color and he claimed that color is reserved only for uncivilized people. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. That's why you see in the runway black and white as the dominant colors, because that's the white people in his imagination and white in the context of um, the 19th century, the 18th century, and then 19th century. In, in that context, this is how taste is also invented. 
how white and black is reserved to those from higher classes because he also said that lower classes because they are uncivilized they tend to color so it doesn't mean that it stay the same but this is how traditions are invented and they're claimed and reorganized this is how for instance when you look at the logo of mexico that promotes tourism it's all about color and it doesn't mean that there's not knowledge embedded there there's no other ways of understanding the universe for instance but it is not separable from history so it's important to re-understand how these things work so that then we can actually uh begin unpacking them mm -hmm. yes uh Taylor is uh, uh, also recommending What Color is a Sacred? And I will upload that book for all of you guys in, in the additional bibliography because it explains also the fetish of color, how color is not real in any sense. We, we still, this day, we don't know if it's real. We don't know if it's the frequency of the light. We don't know if it's the substance in the object. We don't know if it's the movement of the earth. Uh, and, it, you know, it is the problem with color is that it occupies bodies and bodies are actually subject to modernity, descriptions, narratives, plays and history. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yes. I, I just want to add, um, and it's it's not the um, it's not really the, the same subject, but when I was in Oaxaca um, and I was immersed in 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 the place. Um, when I looked at French embroidery, um, I, wis I witnessed uh, myself having a, a completely different uh, appreciation of, of mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, when I was there, I looked at, at it uh, as a jar, mm -hmm. which, I, which I don't when I'm in, you know, working and seeing it all the time, it's, that, that, there was a shift in perception that was really uh, disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we, we actually use uh, a method. Uh, Joseph Albers was also in Oaxaca in, in, in the, the first half of the uh, 20th century, and he observed similar things. So he explains in his method how color behaves because he doesn't fix meaning to color. Mm -hmm. He explains how color can actually perform differently which is what we need to think about. Color is always performing. And in that sense, in Mexico, there's, there's a knowledge that has remained, and also in Peru, on how we understand color and color performs differently. So it doesn't mean that although philosophy claims specific meanings, theories, and way of organizing narratives, it doesn't mean that this knowledge that survive and that allows everyone of us to survive is not still there. So yes, that, that's a very relevant point. How we experience color has nothing to do with the theory of color that this German writer actually created. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Well, if you can uh, pass the name, um, I'd appreciate yes. it. Yes, and I will also upload the reading so that you also have access to readings about color. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, we are running out of time in, in uh, we finished the readings, it's, it's um, very, important conversations and, and wonderful discussions. I want to open the space because we have a few minutes left for questions, uh, anything that has to do with process and how we're going to collaborate with each other. I know there were some questions about uh, the different groups, anything that is needed at this point. Anything related to readings, anything related to process, anything related to how we're starting to work? Yes, Taylor. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, there, there was a term that we went over in, in uh, Puebla and it really confused me a lot, but I think that I'm starting to shape more understanding of it in the years after the residency and, and definitely throughout this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could speak to that term of um, decentering. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how that, um, just to kind of bring that into the conversation, um, maybe clarify that a little bit more. I think I'm getting it, but I want to yes. hear yes. more. Decentering is what we're aiming for. It's D-E-centering, decentered, because it's, it's understanding that center doesn't exist. It is understanding that these uh, narratives are dominant narratives that were invented. 
It's what we aim for. And, and the only, not the only, but one of the methods that we have found in, in the process of decentering our practice is by understanding time and space, to understand the encounter with the power it has. Because through the years, because it, it, it sort of makes us cynical to read all these texts where everything is bad, everything is terrible, everything is rooted in history. Where do we go from here? What is, why does it even matter? I'm going to keep you know, creating work and selling it or whatever or not making it. And, and one of the things that I've learned, and, and this is something very generous of all of you, is that I have learned that it doesn't matter. We will keep working. We will, you know, as artists, we will keep producing. It doesn't matter whether history is vicious or not. We will keep challenging it. And yes, we're going to get even more depressed by ourselves, but together we're changing that. Um, but also we are struggling with the problems and we keep them near ourselves. It doesn't mean we're going to solve them, but we're going to contribute even a little bit to that. So decentering is this possibility knowing that this is not about decolonization, as Sandra was pointing out mm -hmm. in a very precise way. It's not how we romanticize the margin. It's not how we claim we are this minority and now we're going to fight back. No, it is how we know there's no center. Yes, it's scary because then there's no place. And as Ori Lord was explaining, it feels as if we're in this downward spiral where nothing makes sense. If, if I think therefore I am, it's not real, what can I trust? Well, we have to trust ourselves from the perspective of intuition, not intention. Intention never remains in the work. It doesn't matter what we intend. It matters because it triggers what we do. It matters because it, it makes us do something. It takes, makes us take action. But what matters in the process is intuition and usually we are trained through art history and the academies in general to not trust our intuition and our intuition is not necessarily the answer but it is the door that we need to open to begin researching and unpacking what we are finding there that is interesting i might not be able to explain an obsession with blue not necessarily the color maybe it's the process maybe it's indigo maybe it's oxygen so I need to unpack it. That intuition is what I need to trust. Now, the academies turn it around to make it about um, statements. I need to know what you're going to produce before you produce it to control it, to make sure that you are a woman and you're staying in your place, or you're Mexican and blah, blah, blah. And, and in reality, it's also trying to predict the market. And in reality, at this point, the market is gone. So we have the freedom to create anything we want. It matters because then, as Mark was asking, we need to think of the viewer as someone who's powerful, who, is, who has a lot of power in relation to me. So how am I going to approach someone that I don't even know or understand? But this is our chance. It's our chance to rethink. And remember, in the process of understanding art, there are three main sources of meaning, allegedly. The first one is concept. Art is all about concept, not true. Concept will not remain in the work. As we read it and as we throw shade at meaning, concept will not remain. The other uh, source in, in the early 20th century was form. And that's how color was enshrined and uh, you know, this idea of abstract painting was imagined as a pure form of art, not true. Form is also will not meaning will not remain in the form. It is connected to the vicious history, the vicious art history, right? Just like concept. However, technique, technique is where I think artistic agency resides. And technique has a history that cannot be erased. So for instance, when I think about painting and when I paint, I cannot ignore the reality that it was the most important expression of empire. Every single empire, every single nation always regards oil painting as the supreme form of art. It's the most expensive, the technique that you'll find the most in museums. It is the highest in price at auctions, so on and so forth. It's not necessarily about economics, but it is to understand how powerful painting is. But it, So if I know it's a vicious technique, I know the vicious history behind it, and I research it and I learn 
how it behaves, then I can actually try to subvert the rules. How to reinsert in history questions. So it's not how I create statements, it's how I create questions through the technique. How the technique will make the viewer perform the question when the viewer encounters our work. Francisco, um, yes. following up on that, I, I tried doing a little small thought experiment and I threw it into the pot on, online mm -hmm. with the idea that maybe uh, other people would do similar kinds of thought experiments. The one that I was working on was just a little short video that I posted, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was about uh, taking, taking an object that has place, the New York Times, and, and printing over the top of it something mm -hmm. that came from my space as a way of interrupting the story that mm -hmm. the time was giving. Now, I would love to see other kinds of interruptions of, of, of um, things where people are dealing with folks who have place. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is, know, right? yes uh, this is this and, wonderful. And how, and how you slap it around just a little bit, <laughs> right? How you, how you interfere with it just a little bit to make a statement of your own. Right. I would suggest two things based on that idea. The first one is to think about printing on top of it, you know, printing on it. Printing yeah. on it is, can be expanded in so many ways because printing can mean many, many techniques. So first, that would be the first question. It doesn't have to be the technique of printing, just like it has been in terms of newspaper. It can be any form of leaving a mark, printing on it with, right. with, with a specific framework, but also reading. How we read the newspaper is a very specific way. And now we know by throwing shade that reading can be anything. So we can start also thinking about how we read that image, that text, in any, any possible way. Upside down, crumbled, uh, you know, uh, inverse, reverse, uh, you know, think about how can you challenge reading? Because in the process of reading newspaper, it's in a very specific mm -hmm. way. When in fact, as we've been mentioning, reading entails all of our senses and it can take many different methods. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Anything else at this point? And I also wanna ask if you have any practical questions about the groups, anything that is not clear. Uh, Yes, uh, Victoria is asking if I have any suggestions about exercises. One of the exercises I, I recommend, and I think I also recommended this to uh, Taylor when she did her residency, is to think about three columns. One is concept, and you write all, and the concept has to be one word. So you make a list of words in the column concept. These are the ideas that you want to explore. Then you think about form, intuitively, what are the forms that you're inclined to, that you're thinking about, that you're obsessed with, more than inclined, obsessed with. And it also has to be one single word. For instance, form has to be uh, not only a square or a circle, but maybe it's a flower, maybe uh, it's the, the shape of a clock, you know, form and why. And it has to be only one concept. And then the third one would be uh, technique or material. Think about material. What are the materials that you're also inclined? And they might not be related. That's the point. Material could be, uh, you know, pasta, food, could be a lime, could be uh, a wire, could be the indigo color, you know, anything that you're interested in terms of materials could be silk, could be cotton, you know, each one of these materials speak about different history, different contexts, different possibilities. So what are the materials that obsess you? And then cross them. Pick one concept, one word from form, one word from technique, and see what comes up. Sometimes nothing works, sometimes you find many interesting series because then you're pushed to, prove, to, to test other materials, to test other techniques, to explore different ideas. And then once you decide which one is interesting, research about it. What is uh, about this technique that is, um, that is interesting and problematic in terms of history? What do I find, what are the rules 
about uh, yes, com combine them randomly. Yes, Jesse. So so that you start pushing into different directions and then research what is the history of those ideas. Any additional questions? Uh, Paco, yes. could you? Um, oh, sorry. No, no, yes. no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd like to um, learn more about intuition. I'm starting mm -hmm. to learn more about it, but I don't know if there's like readings or even like other types of materials that you could recommend in terms of intuition. Yes, I will see what I can find um, because intuition is a term that I've been using for a while to challenge intention. So it's to push everyone away from intention because intention doesn't matter. Action matters and then intuition meaning there's, and, and how I frame it is intuition is that knowledge that we are sort of aware of, not really knowing where it came from. Sometimes it was a conversation with our grandmothers. Sometimes it was something you saw on the street. Sometimes it was uh, something that you found or whenever something pops up, you're already wrestling with a question. But I will see what I can find in terms of intuition to expand on, on that. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniela. Oh, Daniela. Yes. You had a question. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that maybe with these groups, because we're responding to each um, group, maybe we can organize also a meeting for those individual groups so that we can communicate verbally instead of like, I have to check my messages every once in a while to see if anybody responded, you know, mm -hmm. so that we can organize yes. a little bit better, just like we yes. are right now. I will look into the platform to see how you guys can actually use the, the Google Meet mm -hmm. so that you can yeah. organize him. I, I can't promise to be in the meetings because I have so many things going on. No, no, but any, it, you're like, yeah. right, right. Between you guys and also uh, mm -hmm. you can post questions there and I'm happy to provide uh, readings or anything that is, is needed in that sense. So I will look into that and see how you guys can actually use it to, to uh, I think there's an option so that you can arrange uh, meetings among you guys. Mm -hmm. So I'll look into that and post the information on, on the classroom. Yes. Any additional questions? Because we are running a little bit out of time. Um, I had a question yes. earlier. Yes, come in. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any tips for these messy conversations that will <laughs> arise. My with God. Our families and friends. Just, oh, I see. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. with these encounters that we have, or um, I don't know, even like uh what's it called like small small talk and these sorts of conversations where judgment comes up like i get told a lot like oh yeah mm -hmm. people ask me like oh where are you from and i tell them i was born in venezuela and they tell me oh you don't look latina and then it's like how do i even begin to unpack that comment in like a small yes. talk time kind of conversation or yes yes um, i do have a bunch. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay yeah absolutely well the first thing is that you have to pick your battles mm -hmm. fighting with everyone it's it's a form of leaving, you know, that usually lawyers and soldiers have, but it's not the most recommended. So sometimes, you know, and we've had these conversations through through the years, and sometimes it's not worth it when it's something minimal. Sometimes it is worth it. To me, the way I practice it is by asking questions. Oh, you don't look Latina. What do you mean by that? How does a Latina look like? And that's when you're going to reveal their own bias, if not bigoted ideas about anything. Same with women, you know. Oh, you are so whatever, or Mexican. Oh, you know, it is, it is a process of always asking questions. And, and, and you know, I, I even had to stop going to family gatherings because of that, because it was too much. <laughs> but sometimes it's worth it. You know, sometimes it is expanding. What do you mean by this? And then the person will acknowledge how stupid the comment was. And sometimes it has nothing to do with intention. Sometimes wonderful conversations emerge from there. But it's, it's important also to understand that in confinement, we have to be uh, more tolerant in many ways and, you know, um, open up the possibility for dialogue but yes the the the, the method is to ask questions thank you mm -hmm. mariana mariana yes 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just the question is that which readings do we have to review for next session? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I was thinking about, like proposing, is that we can create a, a like a Google Drive thing to share all the readings that we are talking about, like the side readings that everybody said. Mm -hmm. I I collected all the readings about uh, decoloniality that I have, but they are in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and also, for example, I send the link. Uh, but we can like upload those readings and share whatever we have, like just to exchange materials, and that's yes, it. yes, and you can actually upload them in the in the in the classroom uh, yes there's a folder that has been created when i created the classroom the the, mm -hmm. the specific space and you can actually download any of the readings and keep them if you display the screen you can click on the upper uh, corner and there's a menu and it will display another screen with the option to download them so so that you can keep them and if you look at the chapters i'm organizing them in a chronological order and they also okay. have a date where you have to read them so when you look at the classroom content, I think, mm -hmm. it is organized in chapters and each one of the readings has a deadline, has a, a, a date, and, and the new readings are already uploaded there. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Any comments, questions, um, anything else? Okay, well, it's been... I just have a reminder, uh -huh. next week, the yes. meeting will be Thursday, since, I guess it doesn't matter, but since <laughs> Friday, it's uh, May 1st, and it's a holiday, but we decide to do it on a Thursday, because we are uh, not going to be in the office yes, Labor next Day Friday, here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. so we'll see you Thursday, because I think uh, it's also, yeah, it was kind of confusing the dates of the meeting, so Thursday, is, I think is the 30th at 11.30 Mexico's time. Yes, and also we will keep using this link for the meeting, and also in the one of the pages of the classroom, the, the main message, the welcoming message, has a schedule with all the dates for the meeting and also the times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, okay. thank you again. It's a pleasure again to see you all. Wonderful Gracias. conversation. Grateful for this. Nos vemos Stay después. safe here. See you Thursday. See you. <laughs> Saludos. Bye. 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 Bye.